Hello everyone, I'm Carrie Brown. I'm the Executive Director of the Vermont Commission on Women and I'd like to welcome you to the latest installment of our 2021 Equal Pay Day podcast series. So a little bit of background, Equal Pay Day is a symbolic day that's chosen every year to symbolize the point into the current year to which women must work in order to earn as much money as men made in the year before. And this year, in 2021, it fell on March 24th. That was the day when we averaged all of women's earnings and all of men's earnings and compared them, and we came up with the date of March 24th. But if you look a little bit more closely at different people's experiences, you find very, very different results. And so this podcast is part of a series where we're looking at different groups of people and how far into 21, 2021 they've had to work in order to make as much money as white men made in 2020. So we have with us today a really wonderful group of folks who are going to talk about this. And I will turn it over to one of our commissioners, Sarah Mell, the member of the Vermont Commission on Women. And Sarah will be our host for today and lead this discussion. Sarah, take it away. Thank you, Carrie. Thank you, Carrie. Uh, welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today for a conversation around LGBTQ pay equity. Uh, I want to begin by recognizing that those letters LGBTQ can't even begin to encompass the broad spectrum and galaxy of identities that we are going to try and capture in this short conversation today of folks who experience uh, intersections of their gender, their sexual orientation, as well as the other identities they move through the world with, race, ethnicity, citizenship, ability, uh, uh, language, access, all of that, um, and how those intersect with the ways they experience or do not experience pay equity in the state of Vermont. I have with me today two fabulous humans that I'm really excited to be in conversation with. H.B. Lazito, who is the executive director of Out in the Open, uh, serving rural queer Vermonters um, and envisioning a resilient community and communities that work toward transformation of their economic, social, and political relationships. H.B has been active in uh, organizing for the LGBTQ community for, for 20 plus years uh, in Maine, Michigan, and here in Vermont, and as well as in Portland, Oregon. Um, They're also a senior fellow with the Environmental Leadership Program, a Better Selves Fellow, a former Lost River Racial Justice Nucleus member, and an alum of Marlboro College's Nonprofit Board of Fellowship Program and Nonprofit Management Program, um, and are going to speak to us, I think, uh, I hope, uh, particularly about the ways rural Vermonters who identify with the uh, queer community might experience oppression or access based on pay equity uh, conversations. Also joining us today is Taylor Small, who is the Director of Health and Wellness at the Pride Center of Vermont, which is the, the LGBTQ center that, that serves the entire state and seeks to um, create opportunities for LGBTQ Vermonters to connect and find um, access and liberation uh, across the state uh, with one another. Taylor is a fierce advocate, an fabulous performer locally, and also was elected in 2020 as a state representative in Vermont to represent Winooski, which is where I live, and Burlington in the State House. Uh, Taylor was the first uh, trans woman elected uh, to the State House in the state of Vermont and the fifth in the entire nation. So we are really thrilled to have both of these wonderful humans with us today as we consider the ways pay equity is or is not experienced by LGBTQ Vermonters. Yay! Welcome, friends! Thanks for having us. Yeah, always a treat to do something with Taylor. Um, so I'm really happy to be with you both. Awesome, thanks. Um, so I guess my, I'll kick it off with just this notion of pay equity is a little bit trickier when we're thinking about LGBTQ identities because we don't necessarily track LGBTQ identities. Um, uh, employers don't have folks check boxes around, um, they do sometimes around gender, but they don't normally have it around sexual orientation, for example, for very good reasons. <laughs> uh, historically, checking a box that said, yes, I am bisexual, yes, I am lesbian, etc., uh, would actually find you without a job, right, losing your job. Um, so I'm curious, when we think about this notion of pay equity and how long into 2021 queer folks might have to work in order to earn uh, the same amount as perhaps a cis white heterosexual man, um, 
what kinds of first thoughts come up for either of you? And I guess I'll, I'll kick it to you first, Taylor, if that's okay, um, in, in how you might contextualize this for us. Oh, ah, you hit the nail on the head saying it is so hard to contextualize because when we think of our vibrant and diverse community, it's, it's not a monolith in our experiences. So I would say that there are members of the LGBTQ community because of the other identities that they hold who don't see a, a great deal of impact when it comes to pay equity. Um, they are the cis white straight men that we are talking about who also happen to be gay or who happen to be bisexual or queer um, who aren't necessarily seeing those direct impacts their identities that is not get in the community where we see this overlap where we can't just focus on LGBTQ status or identity in the mix. Um, I think what's hardest in all of this is how we're also looking at folks as, you know, kind of cogs in this machine where we're seeing folks only as workers. We only see them as valuable as part of our community when they are working or gaining those funds rather than understanding that, I mean, when we think about professionalism and the barriers that it causes for queer and trans folks or LGBTQ overall to enter into the workforce initially, it's, it's one of those greatest barriers because how are you able to be authentically yourself in that space? And so I think it, it is a challenge when we think about data and tracking about how we can see where the community trends are, but also I'd rather see this push to uh, have LGBTQ employers knowing that we wouldn't have to fight as hard for protections. We would know that it would be hopefully baked in, but not necessarily innate, again, because we have such a broad array of experiences and ways that we're going to show up. But that's where I'd want to see the push is where we're empowering folks within community to build space to not only support other LGBTQ folks, but to be able to move beyond that one identity frame and seeing folks holistically within this process. Absolutely. Um, and that would be, I mean, that's that's more data to, to try and find, right? LGBTQ employers and like how those folks are perhaps uplifting the queer community or not. Um, HB. Taylor just spoke a little bit to this notion that, you know, checking boxes, cogs and wheels, all of this for capitalism. Um, and I'm wondering if, you know, the other thing that she spoke to was this notion of whether or not LGBTQ plus folks even have access to dreaming about pay equity or dreaming of paid labor at times mm -hmm. because of the barriers they're facing. I wonder, especially as we think about rural Vermonters, um, what kinds of barriers you're seeing for folks around employment? So I'm having like 50 thoughts at once. The first is a note I just made to myself when Taylor was talking um, is from uh, a, a really great queer printer I love who makes these um, pretty amazing gift cards and prints called anti-capitalist love notes. Maybe folks have seen them. And my favorite one says, you are worth so much more than your productivity. Um, and I think what Taylor was just talking about was a really nice reminder for me about that. Um, and I think your your question, Sarah, about like, are we allowed to dream? Um, actually ran, this is like, Whatever. I was going to say it's self-promotional, but like here I am talking about out in the open work. And so we ran um, a project this winter with two really fabulous teaching artists called Permission to Dream um, for rural LGBTQ folks all over the U.S. Um, that's like kind of getting at that exact thing. Like, do we, are we able to make spaces for ourselves to like dream into being the like thriving worlds and lives that we want to live in, um, I think for a lot of our people were spending so much time um, surviving, whether that's in a rural space or an urban space, that um, it can be really hard to make those places, to make that time, to have the resources to be able to do those kinds of things. And some of the work that we do at Out in the Open is helping us all remember that like, we all get to have joy, we all get to make space to figure out how to thrive. Um, and I think that's part of our work is making those kinds of things more accessible to people regardless of where you are. Um, <laughs> like barriers abound, barriers abound. And I like to start with joy. I like to lead from joy. Um, and so that feels like an important place for us to begin to. Um, one other thing I want to say at the outset is, you know, when I was listening to Carrie give her introduction to this conversation about Equal Pay Day, it occurred to me, my impression is that Carrie in that introduction is talking about cisgender women and men. And I think like that to me is like 
when we're talking, having this conversation about equal pay day, that's who folks are talking about most typically. I don't, Carrie's not here for me to ask her that. I don't know. And when we're talking about data, we know that we have a dearth of data nationally and globally about trans people in our experiences. And so I think that part of what the reason I was excited to have this conversation with you all today is because to me, like at the very outset, when we're talking about wage gaps, when we're talking about equal pay, like that is baked into the way that a lot of people talk about it. When a lot of people say gender in regard to equal pay days, they're talking about cisgender folks. Um, and so we we don't even have the info, you know, I'm like, I don't even know if we'd still be in this year if we're talking about like wage gaps for trans people. I don't think, I don't know if we'd even be in this decade if we're talking about wage gaps for BIPOC trans people. Like, I, I don't know, we don't have that information. Um, so yeah, I wanted to say that at the outset of this conversation too. Um, I think there's a lot of places to go. I'm like, how long do we have? Right, we have an hour. Um, I was just saying to a friend right before getting on the phone, I was like, okay, I'm getting on this podcast. I'm going to try not to just yell about like the importance of decriminalizing sex work for like queer and trans rural people the whole time. But like, I'll just put it in here at the beginning. We definitely need to do that. Um, there's a great bill in Vermont right now that's up. So people should definitely do that. And I think, yeah, there's a lot of pieces of the rural economy that look very different than the urban economy. There's a lot of pieces of the rural economy for LGBTQ people that are different. Um, and like all of that, like COVID has fanned the flames of all of those things. Um, so yeah, my brain's going a lot of places. One of, one of the places it's going is um, housing and how much that has risen, cost of that has risen in a lot of rural communities, especially when we're thinking about Vermont. Um, and just a lot of folks moving here um, and costs of everything rising. And yeah, I just think all of all of those kinds of things, if there's something that's affecting the whole community, it's affecting the LGBTQ community um, and often in ways that are deeper and more intense um, than for cisgender hetero community. So I'll pause there for answer one, <laughs> but many places for us to go. Yeah, there's a lot here, yeah. <laughs> Yes, all of that. Thank you. Um, and all of that is definitely, you know, when when uh, the commission decided to do this project of really expanding, you are correct, right? When folks think about that March date in particular, they are thinking of cis white hetero folks um, and comparing cis white hetero men and cis white hetero women. And that is part of what the commission is trying to do this year is to unpack that more because we know that BIPOC cis women experience pay inequity at you know, leaps and bounds beyond what um, cis white women experience. We, I don't believe we've yet reached the date for there to be a pay equity date for um, Latinx folks, for example, at this at this point. And again, this notion of, of how to compare against what our culture has created as normativeness is, is it's like antithetical to what I understand to be the queer liberation movements that I've been involved in. Like, no, thank you. I don't want to be compared. Um, doing my own thing. And that thing is going to center our communities in a collective liberatory way as opposed to a hierarchical patriarchal way. Um, but we know that that's still happening. Um, and I'm curious, you know, I, I, I think to the ways that you're speaking, HB, about the ways Vermont in, in the past year because of COVID has experienced such shifts in who is in our populations. And some of that looks like um, wealthy queer folks from the city moving to rural spaces in Vermont because Vermont is seen as a very safe community, a very celebratory community for LGBTQ folks, um, particularly LGBTQ white folks, to thrive. Um, it was true 22 years ago when I moved here, part of why I moved here. Um, so I'm curious to think about, uh, you know, Taylor, you represent the most diverse, am I correct in saying the most racially and ethically diverse um, population in the state, in the state house? Um, and I'm, I'm wondering how you're seeing the intersections of, uh, of those populations uh, when you think about the work you're doing to advocate for, for our folks, and by our folks, I mean everyone, um, uh, at, at the state level around this type of you know, pay equity, but around also access, um, supports, housing, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I love talking about Winooski. And also, shout out to HB. This is a phenomenal conversation and exactly why I am here for this. 
Um, but yes, the city of Winooski is, uh, you know, not only my home city, it was the place where when I landed here in Vermont, I was really trying to find my way. But once I finally set my roots down here, it just was like this warm, accepting place that reminded me of that magic here in Vermont. It was about being able to get into community, to have our Winooski Wednesdays, sharing music and celebration. But also when we're going into that downtown area is when we're recognizing the apparent gentrification. It's kind of, it's appalling in knowing how difficult it is to find housing here. That we're working so hard on improving our school district and improving access for folks, and yet simply being able to pay for a place to live, knowing that a majority of the units here in Winooski are rental units. So it's people paying into landlords who are owning this property and also taking more than what is needed for folks to be able to thrive, which directly comes back into the economy piece because these buildings, these apartments are going up to bring in working class folks who are going to come temporarily work here and then move on rather than building for and focusing on the families that make Winooski so amazing. The people who brought me in and made it feel like home for me are the exact people who are now being pushed out of the city area where we are setting up these supports. We are working to build this community. And so, of course, this conversation comes up and comes up often when we're going into the state house. But again, we're seeing a culture clash there of folks who are in rural versus urban parts of the state, folks who are landlords versus folks who are homeowners versus those who are renters, those who are young in Vermont, knowing that that is a dwindling part of our population here in the state, where we're seeing folks who are moving away for economic advancement, these young queer friends who I have had who have now left, but are also coming back now once they've seen those economic gains to be able to set roots down in Vermont. So there's this commitment to the state, except the state is not showing its commitment to its young folks or to the folks who are making Vermont such an amazing state. And I think a direct conversation that we had in this last legislative session was working through this pandemic, highlighting all of the inequities and knowing that we needed to do more for unemployment insurance, knowing that when we don't have the childcare infrastructure set up for families, when we don't have proper PPE for folks to go safely back into the workforce, and when we don't have the health benefits or the funding for families to be able to keep their heads above water, again, during a global pandemic nonetheless, we have to focus on the systems that were in place to keep folks afloat. And that was unemployment insurance. And there are complaints all across the board about this, but I am firm in knowing that we need to be taking care of our families. And so that meant putting in additional funds this year when we were put, working on unemployment insurance. I know the Senate worked to put $50 in as a dependent benefit, really focusing on our families who were struggling during this time. And that was taken out when it came to the House, and we were luckily able to get, it was a $25 addition per week for UI benefits. I mean, there was talk about the benefits cliff and getting people pushed off. Well, I'm thinking, why are we giving the benefits up front here? Like $25 is not a big fight to be fighting. It should not have been such a large discussion for what I find to be such a small amount of money for our families. So all to say, the fight is absolutely still there. And it's why I think it is so important that, yes, we can dream about a future where this isn't the fight that we're engaging in. And also knowing that to get to that future, we have to have folks who are young, who are queer, who are BIPOC, who are able to serve and step up and help change the system from the inside while the other folks are changing it from the outside and showing us where that transformation can truly go. And also, clearly, we need to work on broadband so you can see my wonderful face while also talking through all this, uh, this amazing change uh, transformation that we need to see. Uh, thank you for speaking so eloquently to all, uh, all of those intersections and all of the ways that, um, you know, the, the economy in Vermont is impacted, uh, has been impacted over the past year, certainly by COVID. And I think you know, for me, there are lessons that we've learned that I'm hoping we don't lose um, uh, as we as we manage 
through this pandemic. Um, and some of that looks like, you know, the unemployment insurance, some of that looks like the extension of benefits. And I guess I'm curious about whether or not, as you all work to support LGBTQ Vermonters, whether or not anyone has shared with you um, ways that their employers have actually um, created space for them to feel more whole and cared for, right? To think back to that centering of joy, which is also how I prefer to, to approach the work and the world, um, is are, are there queer Vermonters who are sharing with you all, you know, this is what my, finally my employer recognizes that I need time off for X, Y, and Z, um, where, whereas historically they didn't. Um, whatever that might be, are, you know, I'm, I'm curious about stories and narratives of that nature. I have a lot to say about this. Um, uh, so I took a sabbatical this year throughout in the open. Um, I've been here for seven and a half years in my role. And we actually started talking about this, I think the day before, um, we had a board meeting like March 11th of last year and ended up going like, you know, into all the COVID things on March 13th. And so we ended up planning this for a whole year, but um, yeah, I was really like deeply supported by our board, by our other staff to take, um, yes, a really serious three month break, um, which would have been supportive to me at any time, but was extremely supportive to me after running an organization um, throughout the first year of COVID. Um, and I think we, we have been spending a lot of time talking about like the how of how we work this year. Um, and actually both of my staff are about to take a six week break and I'll be the only person working here um, September in October because we wanted them to also be able to have a similar kind of time to recognize that there's a lot of other things that happen in our lives. There's a lot we've all dealt with this year and we need different kinds of support. Um, you know, I think as we know, like LGBTQ people also have a lot of um, different kinds of What's the word? It's not like obligations, but like we have a lot of other stuff going on. You know, I'm like, I take care of my queer family's kids some part of the week. Like I also hang out with my family of origin. I've also got like various partners. There's a lot of folks who are sick in community that are really important to me. You know, it's just like, there's a lot of different things that are happening um, that are not necessarily paid work that we need to be supported um, in taking care of. Um, Something we've done for a long time is offer folks time out of their work today to go to therapy or have other kinds of mental health supports. We also took a two week whole organization break um, at the end of, when was that? At the end of October last year. I think like time is really what we're doing a lot of right now. Um, and just, yeah, things are both moving more quickly and moving more slowly. Um, and so, being able to recognize that. Um, I think I heard from, I heard from a lot of people, peers and, you know, other folks who are not EDs at different organizations around sabbatical, around this kind of staff break and wondering, you know, like, how are you doing this? How can we do this? Please tell my boss that we need to be able to do this. Um, and, you know, it's like, we didn't come up with these ideas. I think there's, you know, there's a lot of folks that have been doing this kind of work. Um, Wabanaki Reach is a really amazing organization up in Maine. Um, run by Indigenous folks who are in the Penobscot River area, um, and they also just took a break in August, so we've received a lot of inspiration from them. Um, but yeah, I feel like for us more than anything, and it's been a practice for me, I'll say, um, in like, yeah, learning, learning a different rhythm um, for what we all need and figuring out like, how can we align our organizational resources and community needs. Um, I think, you know, it's like we're the primary organization that's supporting rural folks in this part of the air of the U.S. And when we don't have staff who are around, you know, we know the community are going to be less supported. And so how are we, how are we figuring out how to balance all of that stuff at once? Um, not being against, I'm like, I'm just talking about out in the open this whole time. Your question was like, what are you hearing? I'm like, here's what we're doing. Um, and I think I'm, I am super interested right now in the how of how we work. And so if there are other folks who are trying stuff out or who are talking about this, like, I'd love to be in conversation with people too. Yes. Uh, the notion of sabbaticals. So I, I work for the University of Vermont, right? And sabbaticals are not new. Faculty have experienced sabbaticals for generations. Um, and, and I so appreciate the ways that nonprofit organizations in particular, social service organizations are starting to recognize the value in valuing 
their employees um, and their employees' well-being, which again, I think we did see an up to, I've definitely heard those same narratives from folks around the way the workplace shifted um, and, and needs to continue to, to stay, that, that, that shift needs to stay. It needs to not shift back, um, but continue to move forward as opposed to um, getting back to some kind of normal um, that was really exploited in, in the past. Um, of course, in order to experience that kind of beautiful care and collective um, approach, collectivist approach to care in our communities, um, that means getting employed in the first place. And I'm curious if, uh, Taylor, if you can speak at all to um, the ways you've either uh, cared for others in our uh, LGBTQ community or heard from others as a uh, representative, um, around the impact of unemployment on LGBTQ folks, right? We can't dream of pay equity or, or some form of um, collective financial well-being um, if we can't get through the door to begin with. Um, and that is intersected, right? That is an intersected barrier with, with certainly other identities people move through the world with. Um, and it's one that I'm curious about in terms of, I don't know, conversations that, that you two have had. So Taylor, any, any insights into the ways unemployment is particularly impacting our queer communities in Vermont? Well, I think uh, the best story I can tell is from my own experience and uh, coming into my own and uh, I guess starting with just coming out as trans and living my my fullness and not being apologetic in that approach, which is not easy. Again, as I kind of started this conversation and talking about professionalism, what professionalism asks us to do is to check a piece of ourself or a majority of ourself at the door in the name of productivity and, and work at the end of the day. Um, and so when I first got into the workforce, graduating from college, it I was apologetic in who I was. I took having my pronouns um, being misused so that I had a paycheck, so I was able to pay my rent, so that I was able to put food on the table and to care for myself. Um, and I could only do that for so long. I was able to do it for nine months of my life before I said, I'm not feeling fulfilled. I'm not feeling like I can continue on. I don't want to continue on if this is what it's going to be. And so I had also established really great connections with other community organizations who I had partnered with. And I was like, I think that they would have embraced me more. So I quit my job and I didn't have anything to fall um, onto. There was no landing mat. Um, which left me unemployed for six months of my life because I was going to all these organizations who I thought would be open and affirming and yet was met with this coded language of we found a better applicant or you were really strong, uh, you should try again. Um, all of these pieces that didn't give any critique, there was no reason for why I wasn't being employed other than what I can perceive as a queer and trans person, which is you are not equipped, you are not set up to support me in this work, which is one, a gift for you telling me that you're not up for it, so I'm not going to try risking it. But also this piece of I'm still unemployed, I still don't have income coming in, and now I am leaning on my resources that I have, my support, my community to help keep me afloat during this time. And gosh, how grateful I am for community for giving that sense of home and, and that community care. And that is honestly how I got into employment was leaning into that, volunteering at the Pride Center of Vermont, giving my time, showing up and giving back to the community that had taken care of me, which allowed me to move into part-time employment and subs <laughs> subsequently like full-time employment into directorship. They saw that trajectory, they saw who I was and how I could lead, not because I was trans, but inclusive of the fact that I was trans. And that is so hard to share is knowing that I had such a positive work experience because I was working for an organization who was focused on queer liberation and who wanted to and would uplift who I was fully. And so that, that is the challenge right there is why are not all workplaces like this? Why are we not giving space for everyone to thrive? in this. And I don't think my story is unique. I'm not alone in this. I know I'm not alone in this. And that is where the fight is still happening, is making sure that everyone has that equitable access to economic opportunities 
or at least being able to follow their own dream and knowing that that might not be this productivity that our nation wants from us, but may just be literally living your life as a queer person and feeling fully seen, fully valued, and just, uh, just a person living their best life is, uh, I think, the goal that we all share. And I think is something that I'm so grateful for within and, and at one point in our lives, I hope, will exist. That is incredible. Thank you so much for um, your honesty and candor and sharing your own experiences. And of course, uh, I'm not ignorant of the fact that um, the kinds of organizations that both of you work for, you both work for queer liberation organizations. Um, and what is true from what I witness is that a lot of my LGBTQ family seeks work in spaces that care for the LGBTQ community and care for the BIPOC community and care for the disabled community. And, and it's a, a lot of deep collective caring. Um, and in a capitalistic society, boy, those aren't the jobs that pay great, right? That's not what we're supposed to be striving for. That's not the big paycheck and the second home kinds of work. And so I wonder about, and, and Taylor, you spoke to this a little bit at the beginning, and I'm curious, HB, about your thoughts about the ways that, with, because the queer community is so huge, it's just so huge and so intersectional, um, that from, from my positionality, I often, as a, as a white person, as, as a middle class person, as a gender queer woman, um, uh, uh, as a person who, you know, who, whose parents were the first in their families to go to college and now has had the privilege of two degrees, like the, from what I witness, um, there is a rift in the LGBTQ community between those who are able, because of their intersected identities, to access high paying employment and those who are not because of their intersected identities. And I experienced that as a rift that we don't do a great job talking through or about. And I'm wondering about the ways that either of you, I'm HB, I'm tossing the, this to you, but Taylor, feel free to chime in. I'm wondering about the ways that you've na navigated that rift or in conversation with the folks you support um, or with, in conversation with our, our queer family broadly. I was like, ooh, which of the rifts that exist in queer community is Sarah going to talk about? Yeah, there are so many to choose from. Um, yeah, I, that is super real. Um, and I think, you know, something I was thinking about as Taylor was talking was like in, I think something that like brings people together in rural communities, regardless of your identity, is like a lot of us have to make jobs on our own at one point here was like, almost every single queer trans person that I knew in our area was like working for themselves, working to work for themselves, like, and also, right, like the, the like, I don't know, I'm like down here, we call it like the Vermont hustle, right? Like almost everyone I know also works like multiple jobs that they're piecing together. Um, like when I started out in the open, it was 20 hours a week. I was also working two and sometimes three other jobs. And like, yeah, also, you know, that is deeply not sustainable. Um, and for like, many reasons, lots of reasons. Um, and yeah, I'm also a working class person. Um, and I think like we as a community, you know, a lot of people like to ignore class and that like class exists. And I think that folks who have access to wealth, folks who have access to generational wealth have like gained a lot of social capital in queer community by either like consciously or unconsciously ignoring or just setting aside um, like their access. And I think um, like, yeah, in my experience in like late nineties, early two thousands, like crusty punk queer scenes, it's like not cool to be like, I have a lot of money. And I think like that, I mean, I don't, but other people. Um, and I think like that conversation has also changed a lot. I think it's sort of, you know, it's, good that we're having more open conversations about wealth redistribution, about generational wealth, about how those things show up in our communities, in our workplaces. Um, and also like, I don't know, I was talking with, we did a podcast about this um, last year sometime. And I think, you know, one of the like, yeah, really dear folks to me who I was interviewing also was just like talking about like a lot of shame and blame. And I think it's like, 
it's also so easy for us to go that place. I'm like talking about Rift, like queer community is also really good at eating our own, right? And I think like, yeah, we are not good at talking about this. And also it doesn't serve any of us to like push people out and like come from a place of shame, blame and guilt. Um, and so I think like to me, there's room in this movement, there's room in this community for all of us. And I think, yeah, that can feel and look and be a lot of different ways. Um, so there's those things. I think um, there's a lot of access issues in rural communities that affect who can have what kinds of jobs. You know, I mean, Taylor's talking about broadband, right? Like, yeah, we don't always have the internet to be able to have a remote job. Um, we don't always have the transportation to be able to get to an in-person job. Um, and all of those things overlap with disability, with fatness, with all kinds of things um, that we know make people more likely to be hired or less likely to be hired. Do you feel like, I feel like every week on NPR, they're like, here's another study about like white, white sounding names that are on resumes and how much more often those people get called, right? So there's like, there's race on top of that. There's all kinds of things on top of that. Um, and yeah, I think we, can do a more effective job of handling that in queer community from like all sides. I think there's like, it's just like lots of judgment of everyone, um, which can be hard to put down. I think when a lot of us are also like, yeah, coming, coming from hurt places. Um, and certainly not all of us are hurt. Um, but I think there is, yeah, there's like, now I'm, I'm like, now I'm tangenting. There's like, there, there is a lot of judgment. Um, and I think we need to make more space for each other. So that's what I'll say about that. Thank you. Yes, hearts all around, indeed. Uh, that it actually made me, it reminded me I would be remiss if I didn't plug this um, tool. Uh, but earlier this year, uh, along with the uh, our partners that changed the story, um, the Vermont Commission on Women released a Leaders for Equity and Equal Pay Toolkit, uh, which admittedly measures things, uh, you know, um, the gender dynamics of the toolkit feel, as, as a gender queer person, they felt binary to me, but I think it's also still a, a really excellent tool um, for uh, mid-sized organizations, so, so places with fewer than 400 employees. Um, it provides information methodology to conduct in-house and ongoing gender and racial pay equity reviews. Uh, that is, you can find it on the Vermont Commission on Women's website. It's a really, it's, it's an excellent way to overlay and kind of review quite literally, logistically, um, using maths, I'll call it, um, but maths that made sense to me, which is not most maths, uh, to really do that deeper dive of, oh yeah, our company does pay everybody well, or our company is really welcoming. Oh, oh, interesting. I hadn't realized that so-and-so uh, has been here, you know, five years, and that person's been here five years. They have disparate identities. One person's a man, and one person's a BIPOC person, uh, and oh, look at that. They're at, you know, super different pay rates, and I didn't realize that was happening. So it is a tool that I want to plug because I, I think what I'm starting to hear from the queer community and um, and from a lot of employee space, employer spaces, is this desire to be able to review and and uh, we recognize there's rifts, we recognize there's problems, but we don't have the tools to address it, um, or we don't we 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 don't know they exist. Um, that, so I'm going to plug that right there. Um, I had one comment in response to that, which I was having a conversation with. Uh, a colleague who was about to be hiring for a development director position and we were talking about the usefulness of um, being upfront about salary ranges and like that's something we do it out in the open that's something I encourage all kinds of folks to do is like post the salary range if I'm a working class person and I need to have a certain amount of money there's not a way for me to know if I should apply for a job or not um, if I don't know what the range is not even getting into an entire conversation around like who negotiates and then who gets more money and like you know there's a lot that's overlaid on that, but yeah, just wanting to make a plug for folks who are hiring to be transparent about salary ranges. Um, I think it's it's a class issue um, and we should be doing it more. Transparent and realistic. That's a shout out to any institution that is posting pay ranges from hiring to what you could make in your full lifetime if you worked at that institution or organization until the day you were no longer on the planet. Um, 
because that's not a realistic range for someone to expect. Uh, oh, so many thoughts, so many things going on in my brain. Um, I guess my, as, as we're starting to wind down, we've got, we've got a few minutes left, certainly. Um, I want to, I want to get back to the notion of joy and this notion of dreaming and the ways that the systems within which we all work and live, um, deplete LGBTQ folks' ability to, to live and dream big sometimes. And what I heard you talk about, HB, was that a lot of LGBTQ Vermonters, and I'm going to say a lot of Vermonters, but specifically LGBTQ, um, dream big by being their own boss, right? Like by taking care of themselves and their community, um, whether that's through collective kind of liberation, collective homesteading, right? That's happening, certainly. Um, and I too think about the number of queer Vermonters that I know who work for themselves and have have decided that that is the space that feels the safest um, is to consult is to run your own um, you know uh, building company etc um, when you think about dreaming big uh, for the state of Vermont for for queer Vermonters in particular to to, to, to witness the shift that we know can happen in our state, particularly because we're small and because we know one another and because you get to know your neighbors, whether you want to or not. Um, what's the dream in the, in the, coming, in the coming years? What, what is one thing you might think that would have a massive impact, impact on LGBTQ Vermonters access to financial stability in our state? Taylor, maybe you have one at the tip of your tongue. Maybe you don't. Um, it's a game of who's going to talk first. Wow. Uh, leaning into this dreaming and what a what a big what a big question, Sarah. Um, yeah, I think it will. What comes back to it all comes back to community for me, and so. I really love what HP was sharing around transparency. And I think that's a, a big piece around decision-making and why we see uh, a majority of our community or even Vermonters moving towards this self-employment is because you are you are the boss. You're the one who is making the decision. You also have the transparency as to the flow of money, as well as the way of leaning into your own values and deciding how you're gonna work in community and how you're gonna collaborate with others, which is not necessarily, I would say, not really anywhere fully, except HB out in the open, you're making it mm, quite the sell there. I am, I mean, always been a fan. And I Come think- Come on down anytime, Taylor. <laughs> oh, please, please. <laughs> It's, it's the, the dream of being able to really work in community and do the work that is needed, you know? And so I can't necessarily say what the work is going to be five to 10 years from now, because I've always worked from this notion of, I want to work myself out of this job. I don't want to have to be advocating for queer and trans health. I don't want to have to be advocating to have a healthcare system that actually cares for the holistic individual. I want that to be the thing. I want that to be what everyone is accessing. So if I don't have to do this in five, 10 years from now, that is a dream come true. And that's how I feel about a lot of positions in the world. Like if we all worked to end that issue, end that, that piece of, of making sure that everyone is fed in our communities, making sure that everyone has access to healthcare, making sure that we're making green investments, but also, you know, holding companies responsible while also having the individual impact of how we can really change our climate for the better here. And all of that to say, I think it comes back to being able to focus locally, get back into those roots of Vermont of taking care of one another, taking care of our communities and having a, a representative democracy, which is a town meeting day is probably the best thing personally. Um, I, I'm sad only to be in a city because we don't get to experience town meeting day in the way that our small and rural towns get to, which is coming together, having those discussions openly on the floor, being able to change your city or town budget in that meeting hire or elect officials in your community and be able to see everyone who's voting and have that conversation. Like that is what I wanna see for Vermont. 
I love representing folks in the state house, but I love when folks are able to have their voices be heard directly rather than having to have a conduit like myself as a representative. And so those are all the pieces when we interconnect, it's transparency, it's connection, it's compassion. Um, it's, it's leaning into one another and being able to trust one another. But that takes time. That takes time. That takes a whole lot of work. Um, but I think it's the intentionality behind and actually wanting to get into that messiness that can uh, show us that transformation here sometime. Again, thinking in that same piece, I love working in government. It has been such an honor to fall deeper in love with my community, which I didn't know could happen. But that's one great piece of being an elected official. And I want it to be a future where everyone just has that level of access so that I don't have to do that representation, that everyone's voices are being heard in the decision-making process. I share, I share Taylor's love for town meeting day. Um, I've been at, we have a representative town meeting here in Brattleboro, which is like a very interesting combination of town meeting and like representative, kind of what Taylor's talking about, like city council. So there's 140 of us who are elected representatives. We all go to town meeting day. I've been a rep for six or seven years. Folks always, I'm always like, this is my favorite day of the year. I love town meeting day so much. Um, and I think like, yeah, I, I it, it sort of just in response to what Taylor was saying, like I think something that's so powerful about Vermont is the size of our communities um, and that like we can have access to people like Becca Ballant who lives around the corner from me, who's the head of the Senate. Like we can't, you know, it's, it's, um, I felt differently able to affect like state and town government living here than in any other place that I've ever lived. Um, and I think like we've been doing that work down here in Brattleboro. We had a really powerful process last summer around creating a community safety review to look at just like safety in the broadest sense. Like how are we using the parts of this $17 million town budget that we have to create real safety here in community? Um, what are the needs of folks who are here and how can we meet them? Um, and so now there's a really amazing report about that. It's like 200 pages long and just like, delays out like here are the things that people who are living here say that we need to have a safe community things like a safer use site things like a freak out space for people who are having altered states experiences um things like restorative justice community programs like it's pretty amazing if people have not read this report you should read it and it's just like here's the plan like this is what we need um i think like my big dream for LGBTQ folks in Vermont, for all people in Vermont, um, for all people everywhere, like I, I want all of our needs to be met all of the time. Um, and I think like part of our work at Out in the Open is like helping to keep as many of us alive as possible for as long as possible so that we can get to that state. Um, so we can get to that like collective, collectively liberated place. Um, I'm like, I don't know, you know, I think like, like Southerners on New Ground always says like collective liberation in our lifetime. I don't know how possible that is. It would be lovely. Um, so yeah, I think like to me, it isn't one thing. I think Taylor was talking about relationships and I think like that's at the core of my work. That's at the core of my life is like, and I think at the core of rural communities, it's like, it all comes down to trust and relationships. Um, and I think the more that we can stick around with each other and build both of those things, like the closer we get to the world where all of our needs are met all the time. Um, so it isn't, yeah, I'm like, I don't know. It's not one thing. I think we need to focus on like, yeah, we need to focus on the community of people who are here um, and whenever whenever they're here um, and how we can like help each other and support each other to get to those different places. Huzzah. Um, yes, transparency, connection, compassion, trust, all of this sounds magical. Um, and I appreciate that that what you both acknowledge is there's not any one way that we're going to do that. There are it's going to take all of us doing multiple things. Um, and so sometimes that's right. What are you willing to give up? What are you willing to take on? What skills do you bring to the revolution? Uh, we have that conversation in my household all the time. I I'm able to cook. That's that's my skill. Um, and, Aren't we just like constantly looking for a dentist when we have that conversation? No. We're like no one knows so. ISO, rural that's, for dentist. <laughs> that's a good one. I hadn't thought of a dentist yet. We have nurses. Um, and I pretend to be a nurse because my mom is a nurse. Um, 
Fascinating. All of this. Thank you so much. Um, we're coming to a close now, and I want to just express my deep, deep gratitude for both of you carving out times in your busy schedules um, and your summer schedules to come together to have this conversation about how pay equity does or does not show up in LGBTQ plus communities and how it is impacting, how, how the broader economic impacts of COVID and, and capitalism broadly uh, impact our, our folks. Uh, this is not the last of the series for this year that the Vermont Commission on Women will be hosting and putting up on our YouTube channel. Um, we have uh, Native American women, Indigenous women, Equal Pay Day coming up on September 8th, Latina Women Equal Pay Day coming up on um, October 21st. And we continue to try and figure out ways to acknowledge the intersections of all of our identities and the ways that some of those are being tracked and some of those are not trackable um, and embracing that. Um, and so, uh, uh, for folks who are watching, we hope that you'll continue to follow the Vermont Commission on Women's YouTube channel to uh, partake of those opportunities for further conversation. I, uh, again, want to express my deep gratitude to Taylor Small and H.B. Lazito for joining us today. And hopefully this is just the beginning of further conversations on how we can create that collective liberation. Much gratitude to Carrie Brown, Executive Director of Vermont Commission on Women for welcoming us today and to all of the staff over there at BCW, Hannah and Lily especially, for uh, supporting this work. Thank you.